Good morning, everyone. I think I have met most of the residents already, but um, for those of you I maybe haven't met, I'm Kali Rivas, one of the new faculty. Um, so today we're going to talk about benign breast disease. Um, I feel like this is a topic where in clinic we usually know what to ask the patients, what to order, kind of how to work it up. Um, but then there are a lot of details in our practice bulletins um, that show up a lot on CREOGS and on my recent written board exam. There are a lot of very specific questions. Um, I want this to be participatory. So um, when I was in these lectures kind of towards the end of residency that were all virtual, I thought it was kind of nice where like the attending would ask questions and people could just chat in their answers. Um, so if that's okay with all of you guys, we can just do that. Um, but if anybody wants to talk or has a question, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, so, and just so you guys know, I have two screens here, so I might be kind of looking back and forth. Um, so our objectives today really um, to review practice bulletin 164 on benign breast disease in detail. Um, there are um, several other practice bulletins and committee opinions that I considered incorporating as well, but with our limited time today um, and this high yield information for your CREAGS, I thought that going over this practice bulletin would be most useful. Um, so we're going to review um, benign breast conditions, including masses, nipple discharge, nostalgia, inflammatory breast disorders, and then um, very briefly just skin conditions of the breast. Um, we're going to talk about benign and malignant characteristics of breast conditions, and then uh, discuss workup for um, benign breast conditions. So starting off with a little case. Um, so we have a 28 year old G1 P1001. Um, she comes to your office for her annual exam and she's concerned that she noted something on her breast in the shower. Um, her OBGYN history is pertinent for menarche at age 10 and an NSVD at age 25. She has no other pertinent path medical, surgical, social history, and her family history is just significant for a maternal grandmother who is diagnosed with breast cancer in her 70s. Um, so what else would you guys want to ask her? If anybody wants to talk, that's fine, or if you just want to chat in the chat box, that works too. Um, I would want to know about her cycles and when she first noticed the spot or something. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So yeah, the duration of how long she's had this particular symptom as well as the timing and whether it um, times with her cycles for sure. Um, Barina just said, is it painful? Yep, super important to ask her if she's having pain. Any discharge, any nipple discharge? Mm-hmm. And we'll get into nipple discharge um, a little later. Uh, Kelly says, any skin changes? Does she feel a mass? We'd want her to describe the mass. Um, what questions would you guys ask her in terms of describing the mass? Is it mobile, but I guess we can get that on exam. Um, mm -hmm. just, yeah, skin changes, is it, is it pulling at the skin that she noticed? Yep, any like dimpling related to the skin or any redness or anything like that associated with it. Um, and then what about risk factors that you might wanna ask about? So we know her age, she told us her pertinent family history um we have a little bit more information here i guess that i included like her um, age at menarche and the age of her first delivery um are there any other risk factors that you'd want to ask her about this is kind of read my mind but like yeah, okay, smoking, Brina says, and hormone exposure. Yeah, so is she on any um, hormonal contraception? Is she um, taking any other hormones for any other reason? Um, and then another big one is, does she have a history of breastfeeding? Yep, and weight as well. So let's say she is normal BMI, her BMI is 23. Okay, good. So 
Um, this just kind of goes through many of the things that we talked about. So you can kind of divide your um, history taking into breast related symptoms and then breast cancer risk factors. So um, we kind of went through all of these symptoms, um, like Brittany was saying, the change in symptoms over time. So how does it relate to her cycle? Um, or just, um, you know, the change in symptoms in terms of has the mass and pain gotten worse over time? Um, and then thickening is one as well that I don't think we mentioned. So any like, um, maybe not a discrete mass, but any thickening of the skin or the tissue. And then breast cancer risk factors include things like age, obviously very young women are at lower risk for breast cancer, family history. Um, so this patient has a maternal grandmother who is diagnosed um, as a postmenopausal woman. What um, family history issues would you guys be more concerned about? Yep, so first degree relatives, um, we worry more about breast cancer and first degree relatives than more um, remote relatives, I guess you could say, um, like aunts, cousins, that sort of thing. You worry less compared to like a sibling mother or grandmother um, or daughter. Um, what else? What about like the age of diagnosis in the family member? Yep, so diagnosis at less than 40 years old. I think that's probably shant. Um, exactly, so the age of diagnosis is important. And then reproductive risk factors, or they refer to that as the length of the reproductive lifespan. So things that we discussed, age of menarche, age of menopause, so later menopause can be associated with a higher risk of uh, breast cancer, age at first birth. So when I went through sort of um, some of these risk calculators, like the Gale risk um, calculator, for example, um, I think it, over age 30 is considered to be um, higher risk for the first birth. Parity, so um, more pregnancies, um, more breastfeeding um, results in lower risk of breast cancer. Um, and then hormone uh, replacement therapy, for example, for patients that are taking it for hot flashes or postmenopausal symptoms. Okay, so our clinical breast exam. So per ACOG, you always wanna perform um, an exam for a patient who has any symptoms. Even if they're young, if they have concerns, you wanna do the exam. Um, and then for any high-risk women, so women um, who have uh, a, a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 20% or higher, those uh, risk calculators that you can use online. Um, for screening clinical breast exams, um, so what ACOG says, and as you guys probably know, different, um, different groups have different recommendations regarding this, but ACOG says offer it every one to three years for women who are 25 to 39, and then annually you want to perform an exam for women over 40. Um, for women under 25, um, this isn't evidence-based, I guess, but this is kind of what I do is I just ask them if they have concerns, if they'd like an exam. Um, I tell them that, you know, usually that there isn't any evidence that it's necessarily going to be very beneficial to do an exam on like an 18-year-old, for example, but I do use it as an opportunity to kind of do some education about um, breast self-awareness. Um, so how would you guys perform the breast exam? Maybe somebody should unmute just to describe the steps rather than the chat box. Um, so you should do it in two ways. You should do it sitting and then also laying down. Mm -hmm. um, typically you can start with sitting because that's usually what they're doing when they're on the exam table at first. Um, and you want to compare symmetry, so you want to compare side to side. Um, you want to um, do at least what we did on our breast month is you kind of do the general like density of the breast kind of so you have like one hand above and below and you feel both sides um, you can have them put their hands on their hips and like push their elbows forward um, and palpate both sides that way and then you can have them lay down uh, and when they lay down their arms should be over their head and you want to do a complete exam including the lymph nodes so you want to definitely get by the clavicle um, and then also into the axilla and then most people describe it as a very routine however they do it whether it's like radial or up and down um, so they don't miss any areas mm -hmm. perfect 
Um, and then how would you want to document your findings? So let's say, for example, you don't have to go through all those steps, but let's say that you feel um, a discrete mass. How would you describe um, what you're feeling and the location of the mass? By a clock face. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So um, here, um, you know, Brittany really went over all of these steps for what you'd want to do. And then um, an example of how you would document, this is directly from the practice bulletin. And I'll admit, I'm not always great about um, documenting all of these things. Um, so it's good to review this. But um, for example, let's say our patient has a two centimeter well circumscribed, well circumscribed firm mobile mass in the right breast. And then this is the part I always forget to do, um, but you wanna say where it is in relation to the areolar edge. So you wanna say three centimeters, for example, from the areolar edge at six o'clock. And then you wanna characterize your level of concern. So low clinical suspicion versus high suspicion for malignancy. So on our patient, if this is what we felt, would we be concerned for malignancy or not? No, I see lots of heads shaking. No, we would not be too concerned um, for this particular patient. So um, in terms of benign breast lesions and masses, there are a couple categories, um, non-proliferative, proliferative without atypia, atypical hyperplasia, and then there are some other um, benign lesions that uh, don't really fall into the first three categories, like LCIS, tubular adenomas, and phylloides. And all of these are associated with different risks of development into breast cancer. So this is directly from the practice bulletin where they break it down by the types of lesions, the subtypes, and then the relative risk of developing future breast cancer. Um, on my um, ABOG written, or written um, board exam this uh, summer, they actually asked a multiple choice question about the um, relative risk for one of these categories. And I was really surprised because that seemed pretty nitpicky. Um, so definitely something to just glance at before your CREAGs or your board exams. Um, but um, yeah, they may ask about these specific categories. So in terms of the different lesions, um, so for non-proliferative, um, what we see most commonly, especially in young women, um, are simple breast cysts. And these are typically benign as long as there are no um, internal septations or any mural thickening. Um, and um, they tend to be in women, you know, uh, it could be younger or age 35 to 50. Um, the size can really vary. And then you only want to aspirate them if they're bothering the patient. So if the patient is having any discomfort related to it or that sort of thing. Um, with mild hyperplasia of the usual type, this can be a focal thickening of the duct epithelial layers. So um, the number of layers is kind of what you use to differentiate this, so four or fewer, and it doesn't fill the duct the whole way. And then for papillary apocrine change, um, this is a focal thickening of the epithelium of an apocrine cyst. And that type of cyst is just um, basically a cyst made of the secretory cell of the breast. Um, for proliferative without atypia, uh, definitely the most common thing that we'll see in this category um, is the fibroadenoma, uh, very common in our patients. And um, these can also include giant fibroadenoma, so I'll show you guys a picture of that in a second. Um, we also have the intraductal papilloma, moderate or florid hyperplasia of the usual type, um, sclerosing adenosis, and radial scars. So in terms of all these different subtypes, I mean, I think that what you might be tested on is what category do they fall into? Other than fibroadenomas and maybe intraductal papillomas, I don't think you're going to get like very specific questions on um, what these more rare um, lesions are, like radial scar, for example. 
So fibroadenomas, very, very common, uh, the most common breast um, masses among adolescents and young patients. The median age is 25. We can see them in um, menopausal women as well. About 12% of masses in menopausal women are fibroadenomas. And um, these are solid masses due to proliferation of both epithelial and stromal elements. And um, since we see this so commonly, can you guys just name some characteristics of fibroadenomas? Well circumscribed, mm -hmm. well circumscribed, like a rubbery feeling, mm -hmm. uh, mobile. Yeah, and typically large or small. Um, small. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, so they tend to be, so you did a great job, you named basically all the categories, and usually they're one to two centimeters. And then we diagnose them usually with ultrasound. Um, they can be difficult to differentiate sometimes from a simple cyst, but on ultrasound, we can tell, is this a solid mass or is it a cyst containing fluid? Giant fibroadenomas, um, so these are rare. Um, histologically, they're the same as just regular fibroadenomas. They have the same epithelial and stromal components. Um, and they tend to occur in young patients, such as adolescents, and they tend to be large, so over 10 centimeters. And as you can see here, um, they distort the affected breast and cause asymmetry between the breasts. Other categories or subtypes of lesions um, within proliferative without atypia other than fibroadenoma, um, we have moderate or florid hyperplasia of the usual type. So um, compared to the mild hyperplasia, this involves more than four layers and it fills the duct. Remember the, with the mild, it did not fill the duct. Introductal papillomas, um, so this um, is a lactiferous duct tumor, therefore can cause some nipple discharge. Less common to have a mass and tends to occur in women uh, 30 to 50. Um, and sometimes when we do a core biopsy for this, we can find um, carcinoma. Um, so therefore they recommend typically an excision. Um, and then sclerosing adenosis and radial scars are a little bit less common. Again, like you might just want to know what category they fall into and um, what relative risk for developing into cancer they um, involve. Our next lesion type is atypical hyperplasia. So this includes atypical ductal and lobular hyperplasia. Um, and there is an increased risk um, of cancer in the affected or contralateral breast. Um, therefore, um, surgical excision is recommended because you may find DCIS or invasive cancer in 10 to 20% of these cases. Um, after excision for surveillance for these women, they want, you want them to have an annual mammogram, you want them to come in every six to 12 months for a clinical breast exam, and then they should be uh, familiar with breast self-awareness. Because um, somebody kind of tell me what we mean when we say breast self-awareness. I usually just kind of talk to my patients and see what they do already, and then if they don't do anything, I just say to kind of check their breasts when they're in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, to see if they feel any masses, um, to just kind of lightly raise the nipples to see if there's any um, discharge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we typically don't like strongly recommend a patient's uh, breast self-exam anymore, um, but self-awareness, like you said, just making sure that they're familiarized with how their breasts typically feel and if they notice any differences uh, that we would want to know about that. Um, because these um, lesions are associated with an increased risk of cancer, risk reduction is strongly recommended with things like tamoxifen, um, raloxifen, or aromatase inhibitors. And then um, in that other category, so we have tubular adenomas. These are benign glandular cells. Um, they can present as a mass or be seen on routine imaging. Um, and then in pregnant or postpartum women, we can sometimes see lactating adenomas, um, which are um, histologically identical to um, lactating tissue, but because they are a mass, they do require tissue biopsy. 
Thyloides tumors. I feel like this was very common um, on like step one and step two and that sort of thing. It may show up on your creogs and it probably would show a picture like this of histologically, this um, cauliflower leaf appearance. These are rare, um, up to 0.5% of breast tumors. Um, and they tend to be in women who are a little bit older, like in their 40s. Um, they have a wide range of biologic um, behavior. So they can be benign masses with a propensity for um, local recurrence, or they can um, progress to sarcoma. On exam, it may feel similar to fibroadenoma. So that well-circumscribed um, mobile rubbery mass However, um, they can grow rapidly and that can cause skin changes um, like the dimpling of the skin like we talked about before. And because of the local recurrence um, risk, we want to do an excisional biopsy with a wide margin. And then finally, LCIS. Um, so this um, typically is an incidental finding after um, doing a biopsy. Um, after you know, imaging, um, there might not be any imaging abnormalities for a discrete mass. Um, they tend to be multifocal, 30% can occur in the contralateral breast, um, and they are not considered a precursor lesion to cancer like DCIS. However, they're a risk marker for future cancer development. So 10 to 20% of these women um, will develop ductal or lobular cancer within 15 years. Therefore, um, these patients undergo a surgical excision to rule out DCIS and invasive cancer. And then the surveillance is um, similar to what we discussed for atypical hyperplasia with an annual mammogram, the breast self-awareness, and then the clinical exam um, every six to 12 months. And then similarly, risk reduction medication, um, such as tamoxifen would be discussed with the patient. And for some patients, a prophylactic um, mastectomy may be recommended by a breast uh, specialist or considered. So back to our patient. Um, so as a reminder, she's 28, she's a G1, P1. Um, we noted a two centimeter well circumscribed firm mobile mass in the right breast and it's um, at six o'clock. So we said that we had a low level of concern for malignancy. Um, what would be on your differential diagnosis for this patient? Fibroadenoma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? Fibrocystic change. Yeah, so I would say those are the two big ones, right? We're thinking that this is probably benign, she's young, um, it's a well-circumscribed mass, so either a cyst or a fibroadenoma. So the ACOG practice bulletin has these uh, wonderful flow sheets. So when you're in clinic, you can look them up and determine what you're gonna do. So let's walk through this a little bit. So with this patient, she's younger than 30, our clinical suspicion is low. So for her, it would be reasonable to just observe for one to two menstrual cycles. Um, to see if it goes away. Um, so let's say it resolves, then just routine follow-up um, for the patient. If it persists, then we would um, do an ultrasound of her breast. What, how do we decide if we're gonna do an ultrasound or a mammogram as our initial screening modality? Age? Yeah, and what, what age? Less than 30. Yep, exactly. It's a pretty obvious, right? It's right on this um, flow sheet here. So um, she's 30. So we're going to um, do our ultrasound. And then the ultrasound report will tell us, is it solid or cystic? And then what virads category does it fall into? And from there, that helps us determine the next steps. So um, I'm not going to belabor this virads category chart. Um, this is a useful thing to look over before you have exams like CREOGS. Um, one thing that I um, was always confused about is what is the difference between category one and two, negative versus benign, but they both have a zero percent chance of 
or likelihood of malignancy. So the difference is with negative, um, that means that they have no abnormality to report. So the breast looks totally normal. There are no calcifications, there are no cysts, there's no scarring, there's just nothing. Um, with category two, they might see some sort of lesion. So for example, like in older women, you might see microcalcifications. Um, and uh, so you see something there and they can say that it's very, very, very essentially 0% likely to be benign. So that's the big difference between those two categories. So let's say that our patient is found to have a simple cyst Thyroids too. Um, so, uh, what would we recommend for her simple cyst? Follow up in a year for an annual. Mm -hmm. Yep, we could do that. And then, what if she's like telling you that it's so uncomfortable? She feels like it's disfiguring to have it there. It's affecting her self image and it's very physically uncomfortable. Then, what would you? consider. Then do like a needle aspiration. Yep, then you could do an aspiration. So the management of cystic masses, so there are different types of cysts. There's simple, complicated, and complex. Um, I wish they had come up with a different name other than complicated and complex, like in my mind those <laughs> sounds sort of the same to me. Uh, but um, as Brittany said, if it's bothersome, you could um, offer an aspiration. That can be done either under um, health patient or ultrasound guidance. And then if it's complicated, um, here on the slide they talk, um, in the practice bulletin, they talk about what those might look like. So um, some um, echogenicity without vascular flow for complicated versus cystic and solid components for complex. Um, and then for complicated, you can offer aspiration versus observation, depending on um, the patient's preferences as well as your clinical suspicion. If you aspirate and the fluid is clear and the mass resolves on ultrasound as you're aspirating, you can just discard the fluid. If it's bloody or the mass persists, then you want to um, proceed with a biopsy. And then anything that's complex is a higher uh, BIRADS category, four to five, so you want to biopsy. So let's say, for example, that our patient is older, so now she is 35, and um, we do her mammogram, because we start with the mammogram for women over 30 compared to the ultrasound for under 30, and she has solid mass that thyroids 4 to 5. What are you guys going to do? Biopsy. Yes. And there are a couple types of biopsies you can do. Um, so there's the fine needle aspiration, the core needle biopsy, and the excisional biopsy. Um, what, can guys, what can you guys tell me about the fine needle aspiration or FNA? So what are some advantages to it? Less painful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a small bore needle, so, you know, a smaller needle tends to be less uncomfortable. Along with that, it's minimally invasive. Um, it's inexpensive. Um, the disadvantages, um, and I had a question about this on my boards. Um, one thing is that it requires a special pathologist who has some additional training to interpret the results. And then if you find that there's atypia or malignancy, you're just gonna have to biopsy her anyway. So the types of biopsy are core needle versus um, excisional biopsy. The core needle has a slightly larger needle, um, but it has few uh, complications and minimal scarring compared to an excisional biopsy. And then a big advantage is that you can actually place a clip to mark the lesion in case an excisional biopsy is needed or for future imaging. Um, with excisional, you wanna consider that in specific scenarios. So certain locations that are difficult to get at with the core needle um, or certain characteristics, obviously we wouldn't necessarily be determining what type of biopsy it would be a breast specialist um, or patients with breast implants. 
and then they're requ it's required to do excisional. The patient has atypical hyperplasia, LCIS, phylloides tumor, radial scars, and then if the core needle biopsy is non-diagnostic or if it's discordant with your clinical suspicion and clinical findings. I have a question. All right. Yeah. Um, if a patient needs to have like an FNA and then they end up having a core or an excisional afterwards, does that end up counting as two separate types of biopsy in like the Gale model or, you know, all of those models that predict? Mm, that's a under? really good question. I would, I would think, I, I'll have to look through the models again, but I would think that you would just count like the, at, the actual biopsy. So the core versus the um, excisional, because if you do the FNA, it's really more like an aspiration. And if you find an abnormality that requires the biopsy, I would probably just think that the biopsy would count. Um, and then, you know, I don't, I don't really know if you would count like, I think you would probably just count it once because you're biopsying the same lesion. Gotcha. That makes sense, but I'd have to look at the model again um, to know for sure. I'll look into it and let you know if I find a good answer. Any other questions before we move on to nipple discharge? All right, nipple discharge. <laughs> so um, another fairly common thing that we'll see. So let's say that we have a 35-year-old patient. She's a G2P2002. She has nipple discharge, which she describes as a milk-like consistency. Um, she has no other breast concerns. She's taking combined OCPs for contraception. She has a history of two prior C-sections, the most recent one 15 months ago. Um, otherwise, her history is unremarkable. What else would you guys want to ask her? Any medications she's taking? Mm -hmm. What types of medications are you thinking about? Like antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's one big category. Um, we'll go over a few others that are pertinent. Um, what else? Is she still breastfeeding or was she breastfeeding? Yep, recent pregnancy or lactation. Um, Is it? You Bilateral or unilateral? Mm -hmm. Any other symptoms? Mm -hmm. Oh, no other breast concerns. Yep. Yeah, so like any other breast concerns that she has? Um, is it um, unit or multiductal? All right, that's a good starting point. So, um, do, you, do you people actually know the answer to that? Um, no, actually, yeah. <laughs> I like, think it's more of what you would, if, if they express it, if you, if they show you what they're, yeah. you know, if you ask them to express it on their exam, then you can tell. Um, but yeah, I think, um, but maybe like if they breastfed before yeah. and they kind of know what it looks like to have like the discharge coming out of multiple areas versus one, but yeah, most people, I don't think would know what you would <laughs> mean by that. Okay, so nipple discharge is typically benign um, and a small amount of expressible discharge is um, physiologically, physiologically normal if it's clear. Um, and then um, with recent pregnancy or lactation, um, one thing to know is that you may continue to have milk-like um, nipple discharge for a year after pregnancy or cessation of breastfeeding. Um, so that can go on for quite a while. Um, but yeah, you guys hit these high points. So laterality, the color um, of the discharge, and then whether it's spontaneous or expressible is also important to know. So benign versus malignant characteristics of nipple discharge. So if it's bilateral, if it's only present when expressed, milky or green color and multiductal tends to be benign characteristics, whereas malignant would be if it's unilateral, spontaneous, bloody serous, sero, sanguinous um, color to the discharge or unidectal. And then galacteria, um, basically that is um, when the patient has bilateral 
um, milk-like nipple discharge outside of pregnancy or lactation, and it is not caused by a intrinsic an intrinsic breast disease. Um, that is, it's more of a systemic issue um, where the patient would have elevated prolactin. So what are some causes? Um, Salma mentioned uh, certain types of medication like antipsychotics, um, but what are some other causes where a patient could have elevated prolactin? Tumor. A tu like what type of tumor? Like a prolactin, like a brain tumor? Yeah, so like a prolactin secreting adenoma. What's another common endo, like super, super common endocrine um, disease? Hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Hypothyroidism. Yeah, so, um, so other than, you know, you guys mentioned these two issues, the hypothyroidism and the adenoma. Um, if the patient has chronic breast stimulation, so I mean, that would be, I guess, if they're expressing it on their own all the time, or if they're wearing a really tight fitting bra or something that could lead to this, um, combined OCPs. And then other than antipsychotics, Reglan, um, Reserpine, and Verapamil are other um, medications that can cause elevated prolactin. So this flow sheet is from the practice bulletin. Um, this is something that I look at all the time when I have patients that report nipple discharge. Um, the main things to know, we won't go through like every single thing on this flow sheet, but this column here tends to be um, concerning for malignancy causing the nipple discharge. So those characteristics that we talked about that are concerning for malignancy are listed here. And then here, um, again, age 30 determines what you're going to do about it. So under 30, you do the ultrasound with or without mammography. Over 30, you want to do the mammography plus ultrasound. BIRADS category guides you to the next step. So lower BIRADS, duct excision, higher BIRADS, of course, you do the biopsy. So let's say that our patient, she has bilateral milky discharge, as we know. Um, so what do you guys want to do next for her? Pregnancy test. Yep. And let's say she's pregnant, it's positive, so then you're done. Um, but if, you know, it were negative, then you would want to do your galacteria workup, looking at her medications, checking her TSH and prolactin level. And then over here, you know, um, if it's non-spontaneous, so meaning expressible, um, or any of these other categories, uh, then you would uh, stratify by their age. So if they're younger than 40, observation, reassurance, tell them to stop uh, nipple expression and then um, look for spontaneous uh, discharge. And then over 40, you want to do imaging. Questions on nipple discharge? No, okay. Um, and then we have, I think we have about 10 more minutes, so we'll get through mastalgia, and then if we have time, we'll quickly go over the um, inflammatory breast conditions as well as the skin conditions. Um, so mastalgia, um, you have an 18-year-old G0, P0. She presents with breast pain. She is healthy. She has no significant history. She uses a paragard for contraception. What would you guys want to ask her? Any recent trauma to the breasts? Mm -hmm. LMP. Mm -hmm. Along with LMP, like what else would you want to know about? Active. <laughs> What was that? Sexually active. Mm -hmm. The regularity of her periods. Mm -hmm. If the pain relates to her period, so is it there all month or is it there only when she's having her period? Is it bilateral? Is it in a specific spot? Any mm -hmm. nipple discharge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Skin changes? I was going to ask about that. Yep, yep. Okay, good. So the first thing to know is this is very common. So 47% of breast-related visits are for breast pain. 
um, there are three categories. So when you're kind of taking your history, you can um, you can think of these three categories and kind of uh, go through your questions that way. So is it cyclical with the periods? Is it non-cyclical or is it extra mammary, meaning that it is related to a non-breast etiology? So for cyclical versus non-cyclical, so um, cyclical, as you guys know, is just related to normal hormonal changes. So most commonly the periods. However, um, it can also be related to contraception. So if they're on um, combined OCPs, for example, during their placebo week, they could have some breast um, tenderness. Um, if the patient is on ovulation induction um, for fertility uh, reasons, that would be another reason why she could have some breast tenderness. And then management of abnormal uterine bleeding. So basically, Anything that you could be using as a hormonal medication to treat abnormal uterine bleeding could uh, cause breast tenderness. And then for non-cyclical, this is not affected by hormones. So um, someone mentioned trauma to the breast. Of course, that could cause breast pain, um, mastitis, cysts and masses, and then thrombophlebitis or Mondor disease is another one. And this is something I had a question about on boards. I was very surprised since it just seemed very random. So just so you guys know what it is, it's a superficial thrombophlebitis of the lateral thoracic vein. On exam, you would feel um, a palpable cord with erythema and exquisite tenderness. This is a rare condition. Um, there is an associated with breast association with breast cancer. Um, so if you found this, you would want to do age-appropriate imaging of the breast. And then for extra mammary nostalgia, um, so basically musculoskeletal concerns like costochondritis, um, any chest wall trauma like a rib fracture, um, fibromyalgia or other neurological issues like cervical uh, radiculopathy, if they have shingles, if they have angina um, or GERD, and then medications. Um, the hormonal medications are the main ones, but they also list in the practice bulletin certain antidepressants, blood pressure, and cardiac meds, and certain antimicrobials. So for the management, um, so if the patient um, has cyclical breast pain and has a completely normal exam, you can just provide reassurance that this is normal. Non-pharmacologic or supportive treatments, making sure that she's wearing an appropriate bra. Um, and then there is no strong evidence for things like dietary changes and evening primrose oil. Um, but you know, those things probably aren't going to be harmful. So, you know, you can tell the patient there's no strong evidence, but it probably would be okay to try these things. In terms of diet, um, things like caffeine, fat, salt, and then certain teas are what uh, the patient would want to eliminate. And then if they would need medication, starting off with over-the-counter NSAIDs and Tylenol, um, you could if they're taking OCPs um, and having pain during their placebo week, suggest continuously cycling to see if that's helpful. And then for refractory cases, there are a couple uh, prescription medications. So Danosol um, is the only FDA approved medication for nostalgia. Um, and then uh, tamoxifen as well, which is not FDA approved, but could be considered. Uh, for Danazol, uh, the patient might just have some um, adrenergic um, or androgenic uh, side effects related to that. Questions on that at all? No, okay. So we'll say our patient had a normal exam and you find out that her um, symptoms are just related to her cycles. Remember, she's on the paracard IUD. Um, so you can just provide her with reassurance. All right, and I think that your next thing is at 10.30, right? Okay, let's rapid fire, just go through these last couple things real quick. So inflammatory it's at breast- 10.40 actually. 10.40? Yeah. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, so inflammatory breast disorders, um, so the most common is, that we see is mastitis, usually in the postpartum period associated with lactation. 
Um, just real quick, if somebody wants to tell me like what they would, how they would work up this patient, what they would prescribe for a patient with um, mastitis who is postpartum. So the patient mm -hmm. comes into the ER, she has breast erythema, um, yeah, no so you can, do a physical, you can do a physical exam just like you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things for breastfeeding women is to make sure that they continue to express that breast. Mm -hmm. So whether that's with breastfeeding the infant, even with an infection that's not contraindicated um, or pumping, whatever is more comfortable to them, however they want to do that is fine. Um, the other thing they can do is like a warm compress. Um, sometimes you can have like milk blebs that form, which is obstructing that, which is why they get this backup of fluid and an infection. Um, if they're febrile or if they have those clinical signs of redness, erythema on the breast, you can treat them with like dicloxacillin, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, perfect. And then if they're not getting better, you know, you might want to consider an ultrasound to look for an abscess. And then some patients do need to be admitted for IV antibiotics if they have high fevers, they're not improving, that sort of thing. Um, so outside of postpartum and lactation, um, patients can still get mastitis or breast abscesses. This is a little more rare. In young patients who are smokers, they're more likely to get a periolar um, abscess or mastitis. And then um, with peripheral abscesses or mastitis, that is more common in cases of trauma and immunosuppression. So like patients with diabetes or um, other um, like steroid use, other reasons why they would be immunosuppressed. Um, and then mammary duct ectasia is something that you would usually see in an elderly patient. Um, and smoking, again, is a risk factor for this as well as parity. Usually this is asymptomatic, um, but the, and it's usually, you know, just seen on a mammogram. You might see some microcalcifications. Um, but the patient, if she does have symptoms, typically nipple discharge or inversion, a subareolar mass, um, or any signs of infection. And then finally, skin conditions of the breast. So really any um, common uh, derm problem, um, you can also see in the skin of the breast. Psoriasis, eczema, um, contact dermatitis, candida, you can especially see those in the folds um, of the breast. And then um, hydrodenitis suprotiva. Do you guys know where you would find that typically? Near the armpit. Yep, exactly. So with these skin conditions, really you must make sure that you have no concern for inflammatory breast cancer or Paget disease. So with inflammatory breast cancer, this is rare. Um, it's typically seen in women under 40, more common among African-American women, more common among overweight or obese women. Um, so, what we typically will see is some skin edema. And what's the buzzword that you guys will always see on exams about what? Orange. orange yes, peel. with orange peel, right? So you can see this dimpling um, associated with um, the breast and the pote orange is the buzzword that you will see. Um, and there's usually some warmth and erythema, often no palpable mass. Um, so this is usually related to an invasive ductal carcinoma, and um, you want to suspect this when maybe you've treated the patient for mastitis and she is not responding to therapy. Um, you want to do a mammogram, an ultrasound, and then a punch biopsy of the affected skin. And this is really aggressive. It's usually locally advanced or metastasized when diagnosed and has a pretty poor prognosis. And then finally, Paget disease. So this is a rare cancer of the nipple and areola. Um, it can be confused with eczema or psoriasis or those types of skin conditions. Um, and it can be associated with DCIS. Um, as you can see, it can have kind of a scaling 
crusted look to these lesions and can have little ulcerations as well. And it can um, also sometimes prevent or present with uh, nipple inversion, pain, itching, and then some hyperpigmentation, which we see a little bit of right there. So that is all I have for you guys. Um, do you have any questions at all? No? Okay. No, thank I you. Guess I guess I have one question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that just like from the way beginning when we we're talking about how do we do the breast exam when we do it, I guess I've always seen it like laying down. Should we change our practice and do it sitting up, you know, just to get used to that? Or what do you recommend? I think we should. And admittedly, I don't, I'm not great about having the patient set up, but um, I think that it's helpful for a few of these conditions, for example, and this is rare, but the giant fibroadenoma, like that has quite a bit of asymmetry. Yeah, which would be hard to which, see. I, I mean, obviously if the patient looked like yeah. this, like that's a lot of asymmetry, but with those more subtle findings of asymmetry, okay. you know, you might um, be able to see that better with the patient sitting up. So I think, yeah, for the sake of being thorough, I would recommend having the patient sit up. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the breast surgeons will tell you that same thing. They want them sitting and like, you know, you wing out your arms, you do all the different like angles to see if there's any like retraction or dimpling or things that you can see at, with the breasts hanging naturally then instead of just laying back. Definitely. Any other comments or questions? I don't think so. That was a very good review. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. I hope you guys have a happy Friday. Thank you. Take Thank care. you so much. See you later. Hey.